Welcome to episode 8 of the Aluminium Podcast, Apple News with a British accent. Every week I'll be joined by a different guest from the world of tech and beyond, bringing you the latest Apple and wider technology news, as well as insight into our guests and their stories in technology. And for our 8th episode, I am delighted to welcome Sigmund Judge from Magic Rays of Light on Mac Stories. Woo! 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 <laughs> I'll add even Sick. more woos in post. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good, really good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, more than happy. I mean, the last time we talked properly, properly would have been, especially on a video, uh, would mm. have been the spo- uh, no scary fast event. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you joined me for the pre and post show stuff. The post show was a, a little bit sooner than we expected, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was such a short event, and nobody was expecting it. Nobody knew what was going on that day. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. yeah um, fun time had by all, I think, and we got to get to, we got to get to bed earlier than we thought as well, so that was good. We did because it was it was what midnight that the actual event started here, I think. Mm-hmm. So yeah, pretty pretty late uh, for the UK, but I liked it. It was a, a different vibe. I enjoyed it. Apple Park looked incredible, um, and then we found out later that it was all filmed on iPhone, which I thought was great. As is this podcast. Indeed, yeah. We've just been playing around with continuity camera stuff. Um, if you notice uh, anyone that's watching the actual video, uh, Sigmund uh, zooming in and out, he's on stage manager. Oh, no, not stage manager, center stage. There's so many stage things now. Um, that's what's going on. So uh, he's not got a live cameraman, um, but, uh, but you know. Not yet. We, we've got Apple dealing with that for us. Um, so Sigmund... With all of these podcasts, as I'm sure you know, because you've been uh, listening in, um, we do a little bit of a getting to know you at the start. And uh, some of these may be relevant to you, some may not. And you may want to go in a completely different direction on some of these questions. And that is absolutely fine. But the first one is Xbox or PlayStation. And I'm not certain that you're a big uh, console gamer. So I was. Oh. Back in the day, I was a big console gamer. Um, And then... I got a girlfriend. Not mm. anymore. No. So, but I, but I never went back. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was a PlayStation guy. I got all of my friends moved over from Xbox to PlayStation, um, and then I kind of fell out of love with gaming after all of that. Uh, so they were a bit cheesed off. Yeah. So I I did a bit of like the Xbox back in the day, mainly because that was the one that my friends were on that I used to. Uh, go out and play paintball with um mm. so we played a bit of call of duty and that kind of thing i think it was the xbox 360 at the time so sort of dates it a little bit to where we would have been um but yeah i'm i'm definitely not a, a console person either although i have found uh, recently emulation on apple silicon max for the older playstation stuff is pretty good it's pretty good okay. gran turismo i'm back so i have only just started playing playstation again Mm-hmm. Um, but through a window on Apple Vision Pro. Ooh. So, so we, we're going to be talking quite a lot about Vision Pro in this episode. Um, yeah, we'll 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 come to that. Uh, I I feel like this one is quite redundant with most of the people that I speak to. But Windows or Mac? Mac. Yes. But I will say the very first time I touched a Mac was. In the, I think, 2008. Wow. Um, the girl, my girlfriend at the time, her whole family were working in music, mm. right, in the arts. So they were all Mac. And I remember trying to load up like a, a stream of the football and almost wanting to throw the thing. <laughs> um, but on that same trip, I got my first ever MacBook. I yeah. bought it from... Uh, uh, from the Apple Store in San Francisco. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to get your first one, that seems like a good place. I, you've just reminded me actually about 2007, 2008 was probably the first time that I used a Mac. And mm-hmm. that was when I was working for a, uh, a paintball company. But uh, I was doing a lot of the marketing and, and sort of Photoshop stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, I don't know why we've got this. I don't know why we've got this. And, to this day, like that was a terrible computer, but mm-hmm. the guy that um, the guy that owned it actually gave it back to me quite recently to try and fix for him. 
I don't know why okay. we're trying to resurrect this 2008 uh, iMac. You know, the one with the kind of rounded edges and you had aluminium around the front and everything was a little bit rounded on the front. Um, yeah, it was one of those with the big plastic back to it. Um, but yeah, yeah. And then my first actual Mac that I got was a 2011 11-inch MacBook Air. And that thing was great. I loved that so much. Um, next up, again, this is kind of going to be redundant with you, I think. Android or iOS? iOS. Tried mm -hmm. Android once. Mm. Didn't like it. Um, and before my iPhone or 3GS, um, I got in early, I had the T-Mobile Sidekick. Ooh. I don't know if that ever came out actually in the UK, okay. but it was amazing. Um, you know, the days of AOL instant messenger and all of that. So. Mm. I had the, uh, I had the XDA orbit, which was one of the early kind of windows with a stylus, uh, windows, mobile phones, um, which had the sat nav built in, which I quite liked. And then I had an XDA, uh, no HTC diamond touch. I think it was called, uh, okay. which was immediately before my first iPhone, which was the iPhone four. Um, but yeah. I, I've I've never liked Android. I had to use one for work for a bit, uh, but it was like an A series, and it wasn't a good thing. Nobody nobody was happy with it. Tea or coffee segment. Tea or coffee. I, I know I, I know the wrong answer. Excellent. But um, but you are as I'm getting older. As I'm getting older, I'm really getting into my tea. Mm. Coffee for me is in the mornings. Okay. Right. Or actually, no, that's wrong. Coffee for me is at about noon time okay. because you don't actually get any benefit from coffee uh, as soon as you wake up. I do. Right. You don't. It's otherwise I'm like this. Not long, not long term in terms of, you know, the, <laughs> for the whole day. Yeah. Right. Um, but iced coffee mm. is the way to go for me. Even when it's snowing, I don't care. Iced coffee every day. Yeah. To be fair, I'm not a, a hot coffee person. I do like espresso, but if if there's ice available, it's getting thrown over some ice. Like, I, I I do like it when you go to a coffee place and they call espresso espresso. Yeah, then like, then you know you're in the wrong the coffee, coffee place. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good judgment uh, call for whether you should continue to purchase that coffee. Um, and then this one, I I think. I probably know where you're going to go with this. Uh, if only one existed going forward, YouTube or podcasts? This is really tough because I think YouTube is compromised in a lot of ways oh. because of the algorithm, right? I mean, it you is. are a slave to the algorithm. And for me, the, the content that you put out, it's got to have a catchy title it's got to have something that's going to cause some kind of conflict because mm -hmm. that's what the algorithm goes for. Podcasting, I think, is a lot more freer. If you want to do a magazine-type show like Devon and I do for Magic Rays mm. of Light, it's really difficult to do in video form, yeah. I think. Um, but, I mean, I do want to get into this a little bit later or, or we can get into it now. Let's go. Let's go with um, it. Yeah. For me, YouTube is very kind of like of the moment. Mm. Nothing really lasts unless it's like long form and really full out. Right. Yeah. So some of the stuff that John Prosser has done recently. Oh, yes. Um, that he's put out is is really great. Um, and then you have like the news type videos that are, are timely. They're interesting in the sense of you get to learn something. But no one's really going to go back and watch that video mm. two, three months down the line. Right. And so I'm, I'm someone that prefers podcasting or long form video. Yeah. Um, again, because I just think that the algorithm kind of compromises not only the content that people are able to put out on YouTube, but then also I think it has quite an adverse effect on the culture, whether that's entertainment, whether that's technology, mm -hmm. right? We're, you know, just a few weeks, uh, you know, you could be just a few days into having the new iPhone and people wanting to talk about 
the old iPhone or what's coming in five to 10 years, right? And I'm someone who, especially with technology and especially with Apple Vision Pro recently, I'm someone that wants to live in the now and actually appreciate what we've got in front of us Mm -hmm. because tomorrow is not a promise, right? True. Like, and if we're constantly looking forward, yeah, I just think obviously there's so much to consume. There's so much to watch. There's so much to buy and, and everything else that I, I think I've got to the point where I'm just, I'm trying to find art and conversation and stuff in its purest form. Mm-hmm. So that's why I tend to go more towards podcasting. Yeah, no, I definitely see that. I think there's, there's definitely some um, examples of podcasts that can kind of live on YouTube almost as well as they do in podcast apps with the video sure. format. Uh, and I'm, I always started with YouTube I did a podcast about bartending when I was uh, bartending full time and and working in that industry. But then when you work in it on the brand side, it makes it incredibly difficult to actually find anything that you can say without having to pass it through legal or being a conflict of interest. So it does make it really difficult to do that kind of thing. But um, I've always found that YouTube, even if you're doing the podcast format on YouTube, it does Mm. give you a lot more discoverability i think for bringing people into that uh kind of aspect because podcasting is one of the worst things for discoverability uh, when it's in the audio only format there's no real way to do it other than having some other medium that you communicate with first to bring Mm -hmm. people into it i think or word of mouth which is hard you you know for me i'll just go back to youtube for a second Mm -hmm. Because I used to be on YouTube. Yeah. Back in the day. Um, I had a channel called TVOS Today. And because my passion is Apple TV, I used to focus on Apple TV. And one particular publication who offered for me to join them back in the day um, would pretty much take my video word for word with the things I'd found especially if like I was doing a focused video on what had been announced for TVOS throughout the sessions Mm -hmm. at WWDC that year. And within about 15 minutes, it would be up on that website. Um, And to be honest with you, that killed my love for creating on YouTube Mm. because of, you know, the 10, 13 hours that you'd put together um, your YouTube video and your voiceovers and everything else. And then someone would literally take it, from you and monetize in a different form. So that I think was the big thing for me that kind of got me off of YouTube. Mm. But hopefully, you know, one day I may be back. I do think one of the, one of the big things with YouTube as well is the, the, the opinion that you can throw out there quickly, the fact that you can mm-hmm. put your take on stuff quickly. And I also think then, because it's very much your take and not just regurgitating the facts. It makes it a lot harder for someone to then take that content and try to make it theirs because you've got that timestamp of this is when I published it. This is when it went live. So you can, you can show that if you need to, but yes, there are nefarious uh, actors out there. I think we all know that. Hmm. <laughs> Cool. So that that uh, concludes our getting to know you questions. The other thing that we always ask is, what's your current setup? Because I sure. don't want this to be purely about the tech news, but also kind of what you do in your creation. And podcasting is your your bread and butter, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. So what are you using? What's your sort of daily driver computer, your phone? Um, I guess for podcasting, it, it does come down a lot more to microphones. Is that an SM seven B that you've got in front of you? Um, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Go for your life. Sure. All right. So roadcaster pro two, that's what I'm running, uh, for my audio. Um, in is a SM seven B for the time being, although I have a Neumann, um, microphone on its way to Mm -hmm. me a lot of this is changing because we are going to pivot slowly to video Mm -hmm. especially for interviews with talent um then i have a atem uh extreme 
um, which is basically a video switcher. Really cool. Um, I have the Rode GoPros as well for when I'm traveling. Little, they're like lav mics, right? Yeah, yeah. Radio lavs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I've got, I'm running a M2 Mac Mini and a studio display, which looks perfect, except if you look close enough, there is a slight crack going all the way down it because no. people that installed my home cinema didn't tell me that they damaged it before they left and uh, they got sacked halfway through the job, oh. as you can imagine. Um, and then in terms of entertainment and for screening things, of course, Apple Vision Pro um, and at home, I've got a Epson LS12000B projector cool. uh, for our full home cinema setup. Yeah, so just um, for anyone that doesn't know, give them a quick rundown of what Magic Rays of Light is. Because ah, it's, uh, yes. yeah. Yeah, so Magic Rays of Light is a podcast dedicated to the world of Apple TV and so much more, right? Um, so we highlight the new releases, we talk Apple Arcade, but we're also really interested in how tvOS can further itself um, and also the developers that develop for it. And I'm zooming in and out and it's driving me mad. I'm, I'm loving every moment of it. it <laughs> it's, it's really highlighting the the excitement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like a Wayne's World. Mm -hmm. Pan in, pan out. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so that is what the podcast is about. I started it by myself uh, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, just emailed different actors, different devel developers, um, from gaming uh, to, you know, all, all sorts, really. Um, and I've always been someone that's been interested in creatives, from different walks of life. Um, I used to work in music, uh, worked a little bit in film, um, and then I pivoted to tech mm. and doing a bit of consulting on that side of things. Um, so, yeah. like it, it all seems to have converged, which is funny because I think the iPod classic, when that first came out, that I think that was the thing that really kind of made me go, oh, wait a minute, I don't need to be interested in just music can be interested in the convergence of music technology film and i never thought we'd actually get to this point mm. where you know we're in a digital world and really this is the main way that people view it because i think you, you're probably the same when we when the ipod classic came out it was like a niche thing wasn't it it was yeah. like oh why would you do that you know and the idea of a portable tv i remember like watching Tomorrow's World on the BBC and kind of going, what? That's mind-blowing. I want that. <laughs> yeah. No, there's there's so much stuff. And I, I think with the, the iPod thing, I mean, I wasn't in the Apple world in the iPod era, really. Uh, as I say, my first iPhone was the iPhone 4. Uh, so that's 2010. Uh, that was just before I moved out to Dubai, and I actually bought an iPod. An iPod would actually be my second Apple product, which I didn't realize until recently. I bought the iPod Nano 6th Gen, which is the mm. one that you could wear as a watch, and it's actually just over there. I just I found it today, and it's still in the watch strap because I bought it while I was in Dubai and wore it as a watch, like so many years before Apple Watch was a thing, you know, five five years at least before Apple Watch was a thing that you could buy and it had the pedometer and it had a few other bits and bobs kind of built into it but i was never a, a kind of ipod person but when i was in dubai because we didn't really have that much access to the internet at the time internet was quite limited over there I was able to do a bit of facetime with my parents which was quite nice when you're kind of isolated you moved over there for work uh kind of alone um so that was that was really good to keep uh in contact but having an ipod where i could download audiobooks and things like that and walk around with my uh with my headphones wire going up my sleeve and it's <laughs> into my ears was was really helpful um but yeah i never had a, a classic ipod because i think i was always of the the mindset of i've got a phone that does that now 
so it wasn't really required but uh yeah yeah so i didn't actually realize that you'd only started during the pandemic i had the the feeling in my head that magic rays of light had been around forever i've been covering apple tv forever mm. in different guises right so either blogging uh, started on youtube um right after tvos was announced um i began with tvos today and yeah so i've done lots of different kind of ways of covering apple tv but the podcast really stuck and that was thanks to benjamin mayo at nine to five mac who really helped me with that first episode to kind of get the ball rolling um and he's been on a couple of times since and all of those guys are great so yeah, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna create something or do something, you just have to do it, mm. um, and you'd be surprised how welcoming I think this community is, unlike a lot of others, you know, um, and yeah, so I think people have become more welcoming, mm -hmm. like in real life, you know, forget online, but I think real people and real connections are a lot more positive these days yeah and i would i would definitely say within the the sort of tech community john prosser who obviously we've already had on the show um he was one of the first people that when i was starting out making the podcast uh, making the channel rather um mm. on one of my first live streams he was watching and uh dropped a super chat in and i had no idea i was just like what what's going on here like I've been watching this guy for, I don't know, it was since the, the kind of early Talosive tech versus FPT kind of yeah, controversy yeah. days when, you know, John was really into his Android stuff, to be honest. And mm. he was a, a bit of an Apple hater. You know, he I didn't, remember. he never got a Mac until he was like well into doing the Genius Bar. Uh, mm. His first Mac was Apple Silicon. Um, and now he's very much, you know, considered one of the bigger apple creators and not really known for anything else now but he was one of the kindest people when i when i first started out and, and gave me a real confidence boost um and yeah it is a very welcoming community like we did the ik -versary, uh when i'd been doing this for a year and i remember it was a long old live stream and we had luke miani and brian tong and john and various other creators who a lot of them have been back on this podcast which is really fun it's nice to have this kind of community and it, it really is a community yeah I, I think that's the thing right you you will see people and i've heard of you know the stuff that andrew edwards does in the community especially on the, in the youtube community and i met him once he probably doesn't know who i am from adam um, I met him very briefly after the talk show at WWDC this year um, in the foyer. Um, and like Sam kind of replicated that mm -hmm. this year before WWDC. So as soon as my flight was finished, uh, I literally set aside my bags and got a cab from San Jose to San Francisco to meet up with them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Luke Miani, um, Sam, John. And there are a couple of German YouTubers as well who are really nice as well. Awesome. Um, just, you know, a really busy time, but it was really cool to connect. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. No, it, it looked like, I mean, I think this year everyone was so eager to get back together after the pandemic and the mm -hmm. fact that there was stuff happening in person. There was the um, Genius Bar Goes Dark with both of those podcasts coming together. I think that was a really, a really good time. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we actually met up in person, which was fantastic. We did, uh, down we did. at, uh, Battersea and it wasn't planned. We just, we bumped into each other and we're like, oh, oh, cool. <laughs> and we, we stood in the queue waiting for that store to open and had a, a great chat and you'd just come back from dub dub. So you'd actually had some hands on mm -hmm. with, uh, with vision at the time. And we're going to keep teasing it. We're going to talk about vision in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, it is a really welcoming community, and it's one of the the best things about doing this um, is that we do all help each other out. And like, um, 
you know, David Lewis, who was the first guest on this podcast, who I've jumped on a lot of his live streams recently. Um, he, he helped me out with uh, getting my audio set up together and saying, you know, this is this is a probably a good setup for you to start out with. Because um, I just come finally from just using a USB mic um, after three and a three and a bit years of YouTubing uh, to actually use something with an XLR cable. And uh, it does make a difference. I didn't think it would, but it actually does fine. Good stuff is actually better than cheap stuff that's rubbish. Who knew? So we have had uh, new products drop this week, which we were kind of expecting, but we were kind of expecting maybe more and maybe just an invite and stuff. So mm -hmm. we've had new MacBook Airs with M3 announced. What are your thoughts? Um, I picked up a M1 MacBook Pro Max Ooh. when it came out. And so... I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. I hear that the MacBook Airs are fantastic. I think that's what you run your setup sure on. Sure is. Um, and there is a part of me that kind of goes, oh, I would like the slimmer uh, Mac. But then you miss out on the better screen. And yeah, there was, I think I tried the MacBook Air when the M1 MacBook Air came out, which obviously has been discontinued now. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't completely there for me. I think the lack of the USB C ports is a big issue for me personally. The, um, the M1 has got the two USB C ports and then uh, MagSafe. Yeah. Oh no, it didn't have MagSafe. That was it. The M the M1 didn't have the MagSafe. You just got the two USB Cs. That's it. Yeah. Which you know, if you're wanting to plug in switches video switches and all sorts it's, mm -hmm. it's not really going to do it for you no. um so no i mean i think it's great i think it's i think it's fantastic that the m2 went down by a hundred dollars i think it was so it just makes things a lot more accessible yeah I, I think if you think about the power that you're getting from a you know from a let's say a normie standpoint yeah. right or from someone that's maybe wanting it for writing or maybe the odd occasional video work or audio work, but you know maybe you're not doing motion graphics and everything else. Um, I think it's perfect. Um, I will say though, the thing that got me most excited this week, beyond the Belkin Apple TV 4K uh, iPhone mount with MagSafe, mm -hmm. um, was the MacPad, which of course isn't sold by Apple, um, but is something that was shown is over this, at Mac Stories is by... Is this the uh, one you sent me a link to earlier? Yeah, by Federico Vitici. Mm. Um, I, what, what are your thoughts? Because you've always talked about the convergence of Mac and iPads and wanting that. Uh, um, I'm not one of the people that does want it, if I'm honest. Oh, yeah, okay. There's a lot of people that do. I am almost the polar opposite and i i mentioned this in actually the video that i put out yesterday at the point of publishing this which was actually earlier today um but uh yeah so sorry <laughs> i am i'm very much um i want the ipad to be an ipad okay i don't think that the solution is making the ipad more mac i don't think i'm i'm actually Doing, I think I'm going to start campaigning. I'm going to get some placards made, and we're going to protest outside Apple stores um, that the Magic Trackpad uh, and keyboard should just be um, burned. Burned. Yeah, I, I want, I want it gone. Um, I think iPad should be used for iPad things. Um, my next iPad will definitely be the iPad Mini when it gets mm -hmm. updated. Uh, because there isn't a magic keyboard and trackpad for it. That's how strongly I feel about it. Um, Interesting. I, I don't. And there is an Apple Pencil for it. There is, and I will I, it... absolutely have that because that's an iPad thing. Because yeah. there isn't okay. an Apple Pencil for Mac, which is kind of my point. And, you know, you, it's interesting that you say that because my iPad is an iPad mini. Mm -hmm. For... Kind of that reason, although I will say when I was an iPad Pro user, and I may end up being an iPad Pro user again soon, um, the thing I did like 
was editing podcasts on iPad, mm. and the trackpad was actually quite helpful. Yeah, no, um, I, I ma- get ma- that. Mainly, my editing was for was used with the Apple Pencil, mm-hmm. but I did like the iPad for browsing. I guess you know what for sit back browsing, right? When you have that, fly me. It, I'm sorry. It sounds like an aeroplane is literally about to crash land into my garden. Well, but fingers crossed it doesn't, because that will ruin the podcast. Oh, I don't know. Get rack up the views. Probably more views, actually. Yeah, yeah, but it'd be good if it was longer than this. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> I would love to see something change with iPad. I don't know what. Yeah. To be quite honest with you. You know what I think it is, and is I think when it comes to iPad OS, I think also when it comes to TV OS, yeah, there needs to be more reasons for developers to kind of think outside of the box, mm-hmm. right? There needs to be more tools, more APIs, um, to really kind of open it up and make each platform feel kind of less restrictive, yeah, than they do right now, um. I think that is the answer for the iPad. I don't think it's that people want the iPad to be the Mac. I think they just want the iPad to be less restrictive. Yeah. Like, I understand. Like, I I do want people to be able to do more with it. But at the same time, I do think that the iPad was originally designed... If you remember the original iPad reveal, it was sort of to replace the netbooks that were starting to happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Asus EPCs and all that kind of thing, where you'd get a little tiny display, you'd get an underpowered processor, you'd get a little bit of flash memory, and that was kind of it. You'd get a really limited version of Windows or a Linux-based operating system with uh, OpenOffice or LibreOffice, that kind of thing. And the idea of the iPad was it was the couch computer it was sit down read your newspaper watch a couple of videos all that sort of stuff and it was it was a very good way to use it that first ipad didn't even have cameras on it it was you know pre facetime i think because it came out before the iphone 4 um but then the ipad has kind of just ballooned out to being this especially when we're getting into ipad pros and I understand that some people would like to have a lovely display, especially if you're going to use it for content consumption and creation. That's great. I have no problems with that. And if people do want to use it as a lightweight computer and they Mm. would like to have a keyboard because they do want to do a bit of writing, fine. When people are starting to say, well, it's not a real computer if it doesn't have terminal or you can't write X code on it, you can't... Like I understand that it's using the same chip as a as a, a Mac, but it's not a Mac. And Macs are for a very different purpose in general. I understand that there are a handful of people and they are the vocal majority that want to that, sorry, the vocal minority that want to make it do everything that they can do on their Mac if they want to replace a Mac. But most people don't need all that they want something they can look at really nice images on watch video back on uh you know take the odd picture of their family if that's the nearest thing um but i don't think the vast majority of people want the ipad to be a full-on desktop gaming pc 20 Mm, sure 4090 in it (laughs) <laughs> I, I think what muddied the waters was iPad Pro, right? Mm. The name Pro, right? And I'll be honest, what I want to see from iPad OS going forward is, and from iOS as well, is so we're recording on our iPhones, right? That's the video feed that we're getting for both. If I want multi camera with iPhone, there is nothing on an OS level that supports that, Mm. right? If I wanted a work office setup, let's say, for example, I wanted a digital like sound studio just built of iPads, right? And I want one iPad where I've literally got my levels. I've got another iPad um, 
that maybe or color grading will and then i've got another ipad with you know my viewer and everything else i want universal control to come to setups that support multiple iphones Mm -hmm. or multiple ipads if they do that for the ipad and the iphone pros right i think now you have the reason to have a pro name Mm. and you can you know it's going to make sense to pe- to pros that use these as tools. Yeah. Now, one thing that I would say that kind of... I, I don't see that as a setup that you're going to be using with multiple people working within it in many instances, right? It's, it's going to be a, a setup that you would use solo because you're working on different areas. Does Vision Pro not kind of fill that niche already because you can place as many displays as sure. you like around you that would fill those well my, my my thought was always you know when they started putting nice cameras on the ipad pros mm. and you just kind of thought well why unless you're you know one of, one of the say um more mature people out there that is using it to take shots out and about of uh, Big Ben and mm-hmm. so forth. Um, why would you want a special camera? Why would you spend the money, you know, for the special camera on your iPad? And I just think that from a, you know, from a like video kind of side of things, I think it would make a lot of sense. But yes, to answer your question, um, that is very much how I'm using Apple Vision Pro. Mm. I, I have multiple screens. If you bring them close enough to you, you can interact with them yep. like they were iPads. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> to address what you were saying about the cameras, I almost think that the additional cameras, other than the idea with the uh, with the iPad Pros, that you were able to use them alongside things like LiDAR. I think that was very much a kind of experimental get ready for Vision Pro, you know, training Mm -hmm. people to be able to use AR. But I also do think that there's an aspect of Apple has found that people really liked having better cameras on their phones, so they thought maybe people will pay more if they have a nicer camera on this without really thinking about the use case. Now, I definitely think that... um, People that use the iPad Pro as their main computer may well use that around the house, you know, if they've got family visiting, that kind of thing. It's also really good from an accessibility point of view. If you want to make videos and you don't really have the, um, possibly the mobility to to deal with the very small controls on an iPhone or, yeah. or actually the visual um, acuity, if you like, uh, to to work with uh, a smaller display, so I think it's quite good for that. Um, sure, and, and I certainly think, like as as I said in the video earlier, my mum loves her iPad. It is her entire computing system. She's got an iPhone as well, but she had the iPad first, and she learned how to use the iPhone because she'd had an iPad and she knew her way around it. That uh, that familiarity. What iPad does she have? Uh, so right now, I would say it's probably a ninth gen, I think. Okay. Uh, which is what my kids have got as well. Um, the display from her iPad with Retina display, so the mm-hmm. the big chunky bezel third generation one, is now the display on Project 91. Okay. We literally ripped the LCD out of that thing because it was entirely useless as an iPad anymore. But- but this is my this is kind of like my my point in the sense of that that customer um isn't gonna go and buy the iPad Pro. Exactly. So, yeah, there's there's very few people that I think should buy an iPad Pro mm-hmm. unless you really, really value that uh, mini LED display on at the moment only the twelve point nine inch, but we are expecting that the uh, 13 inch replacement for it will have OLED as will the 11 inch replacement or 11.1 inch potentially replacement for the smaller version. Well, I I will be purchasing one of those 
um, but for my mum. Okay. So, so I promised her one. Yeah. Uh, about and, a year ago, when we thought they were originally going to come out. And your mum has had a play around with Vision Pro as well, I believe. Um. So my mum hasn't. My grandmother has. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um. And and some other family members. When I went to Vienna the mm. other week. Um, they got to check it out in a restaurant. Wow! We, we just we just do it. Let's just get on with it, you know. Um, really they were because no one in that country will have seen it, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were blown away. They were blown away by it. Uh, showing off to my family, but also I think the experience of Apple Vision Pro, and we will get into it um, deeper. But the experience of it, part of it right now, is watching other people experience it. Mm. Um, it's really special every time, every time it, it gives me like literally gives me goosebumps. It's, it's incredible. Mm. And hopefully, hopefully we're going to meet up soon and we can, we can play around with it as well. Uh, hopefully next week. Fingers crossed. That is, that's the plan. It's the plan. Now, in terms of home pods mm -hmm. with screens, What's your view on home pods with screens? So I was just listening back to the Genius Bar uh, in the car on the way back here. I've had an absolute saga this week with cars. Uh, mine has been in the garage for over a week. It's a three and a half year old BMW and it should definitely not have spent as long as it did at the garage. Um, but moving on from that, one of the things that they kept mentioning was like, Mark Gurman has mentioned uh, tabletop robotic devices. Mm -hmm. And I think there have been rumours uh, in the recent-ish past of a HomePod-like device that had a display and camera that follows you around a room. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure if that just came from patent applications or, or what else. Um, but... A lot of the illustrations that have been made by various publications have looked very similar to an iMac G4, you know, the the Sunflower version. Um, I have one literally in the corner over there somewhere. Mine's, mine's just up here. Uh, well, one <laughs> of my two, I have a pair. Um, so there's a 17 and a 15 inch that I have. But a lot of the illustrations have been kind of the base is HomePod like and then there's an arm on top and a display that moves around and potentially follows you. I feel like Apple has already solved the idea of a camera that follows you, which Sigmund has been um, demonstrating throughout this call. <laughs> Center stage is kind of that already, and it's a lot less likely to break or crush mm -hmm. a child or any of those kind of issues that potentially would happen with actual moving parts on arms and and robot type stuff so I'm, I'm not sure that that's something that will actually come out but i, I well i think it will because wwdc one of the big things that no one really talked about at the time and i remember kind of putting out a tweet about it um i think as i was waiting for my flight home okay right? so this is a world In exclusive no, no, no. It's not a world exclusive. Oh. It was back then. World, world exclusive. But, um, we need the views. <laughs> world exclusive. <laughs> um, Dotkit. Okay. Right? So Dotkit is this... It's open to any kind of manufacturer, and Belkin have actually just released this stand that will basically... You, you, you pair it with NFC, right? Um, put your iPhone in there and you can actually pair up to 16 iPhones and then that camera and that phone will just follow you. You can flip the, you can flip the cameras yeah. as well. Um, and you can do all of that. That's doc kit. And I thought, okay, well there's going to be some hardware from Apple coming and this might be the predecessor to mm. like a, you know, a actual device that has a, screen and everything is good to go right yeah but belkin were the ones that actually released it it's not over it's not released in the uk just yet but it's the dock kit uh i forget what it's called i think it's called the pro stand of dock kit okay um and yeah i'm 
I've set the email notifications for that. But, you know, Belkin, if you're watching, if you'd like to help us out, mm. you can do. Send, send us both and we'll, we'll do a podcast oh, yeah, yeah, wandering yeah. around a uh, room. Hey, uh, I wasn't, not just me, of course, I, ca- I can't get on to someone else's podcast and then be like, Belkin, just send me one. Hey, apparently you can. Uh, <laughs> oh? <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting more and more convinced that Apple secretly owns Belkin because the amount of collaboration stuff where, like, they don't advertise other people's stuff and yet... You get onto WWDC and they're like, oh, you can do FaceTime on Apple TV now and here's a thing from Belkin that lets you stick it there and here's Continuity Camera, which we're both using right now, and you can have a thing that sits on top of your uh, your MacBook and, and you can mount your camera on top. Now, I predicted that you can put a camera on top of your iPhone, uh, on top of your mm-hmm. laptop a long time ago, uh, and I was really like chuffed when it came out as a real thing. But I also think that that's not necessarily the right way because a lot of them kind of weigh your laptop down and it looks like it's going to topple over. Um, But yeah, I, I I have to say like Belkin works really closely with Apple on a lot of stuff. They must get such early access uh, to get their manufacturing and everything in line so that just after stuff launches, They've got accessories. I, I think I, I think they're there to produce the products that Apple either don't have time to do R and D on, um, or just aren't really ready to. You know, they they could have easily you know made a clip mm-hmm. for the Apple Vision Pro themselves, but you know maybe it's not something that Apple want to get into producing. If only Apple had spoken to them before they made those god awful fine woven cases. Oh. Yeah, um, didn't didn't go down that route. It's, uh, it's not been the best, has it? It's not been the best rollout of an Apple product of all time. I uh, I'll be honest, I haven't had personal hands on with it because I I kind of just looked at it in store and just went, yeah, I can't see this being durable enough for my mm. needs. Um, because I don't baby my phone. No. Um, in fact. This is the first year in a number of years that I've actually got a case on the phone. Yeah, me too, actually. Uh, although mine's been on since the 14 Pro came out. And I'm using one of the Pataka cases, the uh, Aramin Fiber. Mm-hmm. It's so light and thin. Like, I mean, it's really nice. But we're, we're both, we've both got cases on. That's inflation for you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> we can't afford to fix these things. Um, Although I ruined, and I mean ruined, the display on my 14 Pro about four days after getting it. Mm. Uh, And it's because I went to a a work conference and when I set everything up, like we have a a, a 2FA um, thing that we have to use for all of our uh, work devices and it was still set up on my old 12 Pro Max at the time. And I put it in the same pocket as my new 14 Pro. And the cameras are very, very durable compared to the display of my new phone. Um, (laughs) So there's a lot of little circles scratched into the display on my phone. So that's the only reason I've been putting uh, matte screen protectors on my new one so that I don't see all the awfulness that i made do you apple care bye nope never have okay. been oh well all right in this case it would have been really handy um mm. but i've never I, i've only ever cracked one iphone display and i've had six daily driver iphones so i feel like i've saved money by just getting the one replaced for 180 quid fair fair so I always factor it into pretty much every purchase. I'm I'm that guy. So I don't I don't tend to break stuff. Um, and in fact, the one that did get broken, it was when we had uh, the first child who just knocked it out of my hand when we were <laughs> in a pub garden, and uh, yeah, straight onto a flagstone and just absolutely shattered. I think it was the. 
it was the seven plus at the time. Okay. So it was the rounded edges. It was like there's nothing there to protect the display at all. It was it was uh, it was messy. <laughs> I, I just wanted to very quickly say about the home pods with the attached displays, mm. right? Because the, you know, what we've seen in code so far, thanks to Felipe Esposito at 9to5Mac, who found all of this um, time and time again, is that it's running a like skewed version of TVOS. Yeah. And I'm wondering if TVOS, with it being repurposed first in the home pod, now for this whether or not that's going to end up being home os mm. which of course we've seen references to as well in job listings and a couple of times recently in the code as well so it'd be interesting to see where things go i think the home pod with the screen is going to be like your perfect kitchen uh computer you mean not so an speak. imac which apple seems to think everyone keeps in their kitchen no, no, but but I but I also think that they they do these things to not necessarily go. Hey, we want you to have an iMac in the kitchen, right? Because they know how ridiculous yeah. that is. But it's just planting the seed for when they're ready to have something that you can put in the kitchen, mm. and it's okay to be to want to watch TV synced up with the Apple TV in the living room whilst you're preparing, you know snacks and stuff during super bowl sunday for example yeah that's quite a nice that would be a really good use of share play almost mm -hmm. to be able yeah to, i mean it's all there the back yeah, end's there to be able to move it around the house and and like it sort of follows you and you could almost yep. use the location of your other apple devices like your apple watch or your phone mm -hmm. if you're watching a certain thing for it to automatically come with you yep. that would be really fun and, and and the other thing I think is if you have a camera on a device like that, um, there were patents from ages ago. And now that we're talking, you know, we're getting into gesture control and that kind of thing. Um, I want to see sign language support mm -hmm. come. And it's kind of amazing to me, considering, you know, how far behind Apple were in releasing their like home assistant speaker. Right, yeah. compared to their competitors, that no one has gone into trying to kind of Add fix that, that one gap, this. right? To have a camera that can read sign language, um, and maybe you're not someone that is familiar with ASL or BSL, um, but maybe you want your own custom um, gestures, you know, gesture to have something do something yeah. automatically. You know, it could be a security thing yeah. as well. So from two two points on that. Number one, I'm using an Apple Watch Series 7 right now, which mm -hmm. is essentially feature compatible with the Series 9 that we have, um, apart from the car crash detection, which I'm hoping I'm not going to need too often. And um, there we go. There's a little thumbs up for you. Um, <laughs> love, love having continuity camera stuff. Um, but number two, it has got the accessibility features for the pinch to, um, uh, you know, and the full fist gestures as well. Mm -hmm. So I've got that turned on and I've been using it recently and it's great. Um, yeah. So number one, don't buy a Series 9 Apple Watch, for goodness sake. They're far too expensive. <laughs> this was 160 like compared to 400 odd. Number two. I know you're very much into your TV stuff. Did you watch Echo? I did. So you will be familiar. I, I watch then. it all. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. I, I, I actually really enjoyed it. I know a lot of people didn't. But you will then be familiar with the uh, contact lens that was given to her by Kingpin. Okay. Which translated speech directly into ASL mm -hmm. um, as an augmented reality thing. Is this something that we could see potentially as a use case for Vision Pro in future. Um, we know that Live Translate is something that's definitely come to Samsung phones just recently, mm -hmm. but we know that Apple is pushing as well into um, uh, into a lot of AI stuff um, 
And there have been some knowing nods from Apple execs in interviews saying, yeah, we're not behind. Um, so is this something we might see or would actually like live subtitling be something that's more useful? I'm not 100% down with um, accessibility okay. and which would be more useful. But So there is live sub subtitling in FaceTime already. Mm -hmm. And now there are um transcriptions that have come to apple Podcasts this week mm. um just automatic yeah so you know when you're talking about like artificial intelligence and proper artificial intelligence like on device machine learning yeah. right and not just you know supported by a bunch of servers somewhere processing your data um apple apple are there it's just how they implement it um it does feel like there's always there's so much going on at Apple mm. that they get to a point where it's almost like they don't finish the story. They don't see the story through completely with everything that they do. And you kind of go, okay, yeah, let, let's just take this two steps further. Um, and sometimes it happens and it, it takes a long time to get there. And sometimes it never happens at all. And that, I, I would say, you know, following Apple is frustrating. Mm. I think Apple is, I mean, far and away the best in terms of the uh, the accessibility features and how usable they are. Um, someone else that I met while we were actually at uh, Battersea was Andre Louis, who did the uh, the Mac Madness track that I use as the opening now for my um, regular video episodes, um, using some of the Mac startup sounds and things like that as part of the track. Uh, incredible musician, um, but uh, very much partially sighted. Um, and the way that he was using his iPhone while we were there, he, he came in with his son, like walked over to me and, and you know, hi, really nice to meet you like we'd been chatting online and it was like fantastic to meet him um but the way that he was just like holding his iphone next to his ear and using voiceover and just swiping upwards and down and across but so quickly like he knew mm -hmm. what all of these prompts were because he'd been using it for years um but he's been featured in one of apple's own um videos as well I, i'm not sure which event it was for but they did some stuff about accessibility and musicians and artists that were the using these things and it was like inspirational to see how quickly he could use it and one of the other things that always came to mind for me with vision pro is you know we've got these cameras on the outside which are pretty good you know mm -hmm. it, it doesn't look like perfect reality but you've got um you've got depth sensing you've got all of that sort of stuff and apple released a lot of stuff about accessibility through the iphone where you could point it at different devices and it would read the labels on your microwave and that kind of thing i can see people with limited vision wearing a vision pro and it basically giving them eyes and reading the world around them to them it, at some point it's it's interesting because so my grandmother, she's a matriarch of her family. She she tried Apple Vision Pro, and she was really surprised how well she could see. One of the things that she struggles with is the, her clarity of vision, right? In the sense of it's very dark for her. Um, so if she's in dark light, or if let's say for example she was watching something on a standard SDR television, right? And it and the the film has been shot for high dynamic range. She can't see hardly anything on screen, and she was blown away by the clarity that she was given because of those screens in the Apple Vision Pro. Um, and so I think there is something there um, for the future. Mm -hmm. um, as much as again, I'm appreciative of what's in front of me because it is a magical device. And I think we're going to get into it now, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've had it for over a month now. Um, I picked it up on release day yeah. in Cupertino. And every time I put it on, there is something about it just makes me smile and just blows me away. Yeah. 
Um, it's really difficult to describe. It's something that you have to try yourself, but I'm going to do my best during this conversation mm -hmm. to answer questions and, and describe my experiences, I guess. Yeah. So what's your, I know you've mentioned already, like watching other people use it has been one of the best things for you. Mm -hmm. But what is your favorite experience within Vision Pro? Because I know you were one of the first people probably to actually be on an airline. Sure. Know, sit, sitting there actually watching stuff while on an aircraft uh, without, I don't know, having to have a bag over your head so that, uh, you know, <laughs> for, for testing purposes. I assume uh -huh. Apple has a private jet. That they just fly around in just to test it. Who knows, right? The carbon footprint um, is incredible. <laughs> um, I... What's the best experience? Uh, I'll tell you what, my initial experience with Apple Vision Pro was just looking at the different environments mm -hmm. and just seeing how how well they were put together in the sense of, not not just from a video standpoint, but the audio, the different echoes, the different effects, the yeah. different sound that you would hear. That to me was mind blowing. Mm. Right. And, and really I, I can spend time in an environment doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And I have fallen in sleep with Apple vision pro really? a few times, right? Just looking at the stars and Mount hood is amazing mm. in that sense. And I would say like from a mental health point of view, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. Right. Um, the other thing that blows me away is actually capturing video mm -hmm. and photo on this device. Right. It's not the best quality or whatever, but what it gives you is a one to one memory of you in that moment. Right. So when I was in Vienna um, a couple of weeks ago now, we went to the butterfly sanctuary. Yeah. And I decided to put it on during our visit to the butterfly sanctuary and checking out the spatial videos from that trip. Um, there was a butterfly that landed on my great aunt's finger. Yeah. Um, just like the demo. In yeah. The, I was going to uh, say with the dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> with the dinosaur. Um, and being able to capture those moments, mm. I think are just really that they're special. And unless it's like a personal moment, that you're capturing, you're not really going to get the full kind of emotional effect of that. Yeah. The demo that is going to be shown in stores, hopefully soon in the UK and, and Europe and outside of the U S um, you know, the, the immersive demo is incredible and it's also in the TV app. Um, but yeah, those personal moments, being able to replay those really special. And I would say mm. actually over video, Spatial photos need to be given their props because okay. they're probably more impressive than video right? for me. I mean, there's been a huge amount of people that have said that panoramas are a really impressive use case, especially because quite often you've taken those panoramas maybe five, six years ago. And now <laughs> that was already built into the iPhone and now you understand why. <laughs> and, and now they look incredible mm. right even on a phone that uh, we're, we're talking like i think before the iphone 10 you could shoot oh panoramas, panoramas were there from 4 or 4s yeah right and i've got those in my photo library right the, the benefit of having an icloud yeah subscription right and just being able to keep everything um yeah that that to me is really special mm. like the the photo and video and you know the weird thing right that everyone was saying wasn't it oh but you know the dad he's being taken away like the kids can't really interact with him because he's filming them right i'm using the phone at the moment but uh if you if you picture yourself using your phone right you're like this there is a complete block there yeah. between you and the people, right? And therefore, th that connection's completely lost. Mm -hmm. But at least 
your hands are free. Yeah. Right. You're not having to steady your shot and everything else as much. Right. And you can just be normal and have a, like a fairly normal interaction. And yes, it's going to look alien and a bit weird right now, but already people are getting used to it. And, you know, as much as like, I'm not a fan necessarily of the TikTok memes and stuff. The thing that those TikTok memes are doing, even though they're dramatic and, you know, someone's walking around doing all of this, they're normalizing it. Mm. And I love that. I'm thinking of it myself as a dad. Mm -hmm. On Christmas morning, I'm always told to go downstairs first, film the boys as they come into the room, and then film them opening their presents. Yeah. It would be far easier to just be wearing this and interacting and using my hands to help them unwrap things and being a part of that video. Absolutely. Like that, And we have to remember, this Vision Pro is as big and bulky as it will ever be. Yep. Like we've said with everything else that has happened in tech, this is the worst version of it that there will ever be. So I think, yeah, you know, once we do get down to the the smaller versions, whether that is glasses or whether it's what we've we've heard recently, the idea of potentially having cameras in AirPods, which is a very strange implementation of it, but potentially if you don't need to have stuff in front of your eyes, and you can wear your AirPods and it is taking visual images in front of you, that might be another thing for that accessibility. Uh, I think that's about. I think that's exactly what the play is there. Um, but yeah, I I do think that that is possibly a, a more usable version of of what we already do. Uh, the idea mm-hmm. of wearing the headset and capturing that Christmas morning that is something you would want to look back on. I think. Um, yeah. And and it is. A and memory. I think you want to look back on it through your own eyes. Yeah. Right or. Yeah, yeah. And and imagine not only like capturing someone else, but imagine your loved ones, you know, um, and as I said at the beginning of this conversation, you know, tomorrow's not a promise for any of us, mm. right? And imagine what those memories are going to be like to actually be able to replay and watch it through your father's eyes or, mm. you know, your late mother's eyes or whoever it might be yeah i think there's something actually quite special about that as well and actually when you look at an overall version of what apple's doing at the minute personal voice Mm -hmm. so that's that's some another way to kind of keep people alive in your memories um these spatial video memories i think apple is very much i think we've always said that they are the more kind of human version of things even though humane thinks that their weird pin that shoots a laser at your hand is the one i think apple's already kind of nailing it (laughs) yeah i mean you know from an apple vision pro perspective of course my main focus is going to be the entertainment offerings tv right you know how many cinemas are out there Uh, we talked privately about a very famous cinema where you live the closing electric. down yeah but there are a lot of cinemas out there that aren't accessible mm-hmm. for people right um my local cinema is a great cinema but there was a time where the lift just didn't work so if you had accessibility needs there was no way you could watch half the films because they were on the second floor mm-hmm now you can literally just put on the Apple Vision Pro and watch your films in the highest quality, probably better quality than most cinema projections can give. That's that's what a lot of people have been saying, you know, people that have gone to see the second Dune movie, but they watched the first one in Vision Pro beforehand to remind themselves, and they were disappointed in the second one because the quality of going to see it on a massive screen is not up there with watching it in Vision Pro now. I, I think the thing that is going to keep cinema alive with Apple Vision Pro being a thing now um, 
is the communal aspect mm -hmm. to going to the cinema. I think that is really important and I want to see cinema stay alive um, because I think it's, I think it's important for cr the creators yeah. out there, you know, kind of getting sick of just seeing things flung on streaming mm -hmm. and not really given the razzmatazz and you know and not really being celebrated it's just being another thing that is in a content library um and i think that's a problem across streaming yeah um so i want to see cinema continue where i think the communal aspect you know the communal element could come in um is going to be hopefully this summer at WWDC when mm -hmm. Vision OS 2.0 is announced. Yeah. Um, cause there was a podcast that honestly I'd slept on for a while, but I watched it. It was Tim Cook being interviewed by Dua Lipa. I've heard about this interview. I've watched some of it, I think, or I watched it, but I was kind of doing things in the background. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, it was a it was an interesting conversation. Like, you know, it was very easygoing mm -hmm. and everything else. But the one thing that kind of slipped out was, you know, the Tim Cook talking about the interactivity that he foresees in terms of we're both able to be in different places and you know have like a a presentation board there and be able to work together mm. on on that right. And of course, that's all baked into iPad OS already. Yeah. Right. With things like Freeform. So, exactly. With Freeform. So that's where I hope Vision OS 2.0 will be. Um, but it may be, and I've just installed the latest update that came out earlier this evening. Uh, 1.1, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's 1.1. Because it has been a bit buggy, um, have had overheating issues and this kind of thing. And you know what? It's fine because I'm on the bleeding edge. This isn't my first rodeo in terms of a new product from Apple, right? And I understand how things go and I'm, I'm here to experience that whole thing. I'm here to experience the weird apps that come out from app developers that maybe don't make a lot of sense yeah. initially, but introduce really interesting ideas that then Apple can build upon mm. and just give Sherlock. those extra pieces. <laughs> well, no, not necessarily give those extra pieces. There's this really strange app. It's called television by okay. sandwich, right? Oh, I think and I've seen this. It's like the classic TV set, right? Right. Well, it's actually a range of TV sets, right? And you can put them wherever you want to, right? Mm -hmm. In your room, right? And so I wanted to find something that was as near to the television set that I initially grew up with, yeah, right? Which was one of those where you put push the button um, and if you wanted to change the channel, you push the other button and the other, and the, but the channel that you had before pops out. kind of like pops out, right? Um, and... I was able to take that TV, put it in exactly the spot where I used to have that TV, right? And you can play your personal video files. Mm. Now, the one thing about video in the digital age is unless you're pirating, really you can't do anything with that video, mm. right? Apple have been very open with audio um, and iTunes, being DRM free for a long, long time, but video hasn't gone down that route yet. And so if you really want to take your video anywhere, you almost have a better ability to do that by either ripping the film or whatever it might be, or getting it in the other nefarious ways. Right. But I am someone that, has over 2,000 films and 300 TV shows in their iTunes account. With receipts. Right? With receipts, <laughs> right? Um, and the thing that they're trying to do, which I think is really interesting, 
is beyond these kind of different setups. And we're talking like everything from, you know, your traditional flat screen TVs to like a wall of different televisions, mm. which is really, really cool. And it works with spatial audio and everything else. But they've just integrated YouTube playback into it. Nice. And they're talking to Apple and other mm. video platforms about giving them access to be able to play our con our purchase content in these ways as well. It which sounds, would be it sounds incredible. like it would be a great way to watch uh, Severance on like a really old CRT. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean the first thing I did was I dug out a uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, the trailer, right? Um I found like a old TV recording on YouTube, downloaded it, played it in there, and it was amazing because the very first time I watched Terminator 2 Judgment Day was, I think, 10 p.m. on a Friday night on BBC One when, you know, we had like the weekend, the Friday night movie. Mm. Right. Um, so, yeah, like it's it's really that kind of thing's really special. But and I know this is a really long answer, but. The best, I think the most emotional that I got from like a third party piece of content um, was Amaze VR. Okay. Um, I'm a big, big music fan. I worked in music for a long time. Um, worked with lots of different metal bands and punk bands back in the day, in the early 2000s. And one of them was Avenged Sevenfold, mm -hmm. who have their concert in Amaze VR. Um, and it is absolutely mind-boggling yeah uh really really special because they're at, they're able to be super creative now unless you've got you know massive budget and you've got a stadium tour right um you're not going to be able to do half the things that you would envision and even then you can't because of you know health and safety and different venues just not being able to accommodate in a maze VR, you can literally do whatever you want to do. And some of the visions that I was talking to Matt about years ago, the lead singer, yeah, um, I'm seeing come to fruition in this virtual arena. You know, yeah, it's it's really really special, really special what they're doing there. That sounds awesome. One thing that just came to mind before before we moved on to the the band stuff. Uh, was the idea of having different environments to watch different seasons of things like uh, For All Mankind. So mm -hmm. you have period accurate places to watch them. That yeah, might yeah. be quite nice. Um, there's there's so much that can be done, isn't there, when you can kind of take over the space. Well, you know, with artificial intelligence, right, I, I think I saw there was a still of reservoir dogs mm -hmm. and they were able to expand beyond that yeah. through AI. Um, I'd love to be able to see like a, a bit of an expansion beyond the, mm. beyond the screen of what might be beyond that. Could you imagine like some of the scenes from apocalypse now? Yeah. How incredible that would look. And I shared that a few months ago and I think Brian Tong kind of shot me down pretty quickly and just said like, this is not what, that's not what the uh, director wanted. This is well, no, this isn't what environments are going to entail, but I can't see why that couldn't happen, yeah, you know, um, in the future. But what about um, having two versions as well? So you've got your digital crown mm -hmm. and you can twist it so you've got either the immersive movie version or you've got the behind the scenes version so you can see the car, the crew, the directors. It <laughs> Exactly. This is actually something. So I pitched recently to quite a big media company mm -hmm. that are on Apple Vision Pro right now. Um, quite a big streaming service. And the other thing that I said to them, which is, I think, another thing that in Apple Vision Pro is highly underrated, is spatial objects, right? We've all been to, if we've been lucky enough, we've all been to Disneyland or we've been to like the Warner Brothers tour or, you know, something like that. And 
when you go and you have a look at all the different exhibits, they're behind glass, mm. right? And the thing you really want to do is take a photo of it, but then you get the reflection bounce. And you can't quite see the detail that you want to see. And I said to this company, I said, you have these exhibits available for people, mm -hmm. but you have to continuously shuffle them around, right? why don't you almost gamify video, right? In the sense of, okay, you watch this season or you watch this episode this week, right? And you'll get an item from the show mm -hmm. that you can explore spatially and virtually, right? And therefore you're, you're bringing up the minutes watched, right? Maybe there's a classic film that you would never even think of you know, going because you've got a whole backlog of new stuff to watch. Well, if they say this week only, if you go and watch, I don't know, Lord of Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're going to give you some something virtual, right? Yeah, that is a way of keeping people subscribed and offering extra value there. I think. Yeah, and and kind of keeping that loyalty beyond the churn. Yeah. And this could also, I mean, this could even tie in with NFTs, which I know have taken a bit of a tumble recently, but mm -hmm. the idea of having the NFT wallet where your virtual ticket stubs live from gigs that you've been to. Sure. It becomes like your shop front of these are the things that I'm passionate about, mm -hmm. where you can kind of visit someone else's uh, public wallet and see those things that they've collected i also think you know going back to like the back you know behind the scenes stuff right mm. it could be a really good educational tool even if you're only sharing um a costume yeah right if you're sharing a costume and you've got someone that might be interested in getting into the industry from a costume design perspective and then suddenly they're able to just kind of pinch and drag and look at how that's been threaded, how mm. that's been put together, and spin it around, rotate, do whatever you want to with it, right? When it comes to them getting employed and having job offers, where are they going to want to go? They've already built that relationship virtually Absolutely. with that particular studio. Yeah. So that's they're the kind of things that I feel like spatial computing mm -hmm. is going to bring beyond the a million screens everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And and again, I know this is very different, but taking it back to that kind of NFT thing, mm. if you're talking about costumes, maybe if you've collected that costume, you could wear that as a character in your favourite game. Maybe there could be cross-platform where these models can, you know, you can, sure. I mean, you can choose something obscure that shows off what you're really into within a game. Well, you know, Disney have just partnered up with Epic, right? And put in a bunch of money into Epic. Sorry, Epic. <sighs> so, you know, um, yeah, I, I hear you. So I'm sure there'll um, be some Android games that you can use Disney characters in soon. <laughs> but, yeah, I think, like, say, going away from the the whole kind of, like, metaverse concept of, hey, here's a sofa that you can have virtually, and this is the world that you're going to live in now. Mm. Because that is not what Apple Vision Pro does and it has the yeah. real, your real world around you, right? The objects, I almost feel like that you could bring in to that space have more meaning, mm. right? And because they're more clear than the world around you, and I think that's done purposefully, yeah. um, is a good thing. Mm. And this is um, one of the things that when we had Jacqueline... Uh, from nothing but tech on the podcast uh, we were talking about those 3d models that we've seen people like marquez uh did a, a video with the formula one car in the room and he sure. was doing a video with uh clear abrams i don't know if you're aware of she does um huge if true so like really big science kind of videos incredible creator really worth checking out if you haven't already but the two of them were in a room and they were both looking at a Formula One car that was in the room, but it was not the same Formula One car. 
like if one of them interacted with it the other one wouldn't see that those changes that's something else that i think whether that becomes a part of share play or something along those lines where there's an object that can be grounded into a room and multiple people can interact with at the same time mm -hmm. that's certainly going to be something that if nothing else industry can use if they're talking about you know engineering designs around something like formula one car for example um that's going to be something that takes it to another level as well um but that's going to take I don't know what level of processing for two vision pros to talk to each other and ground an object in the same location. Mm. But that's, yeah, there's so much that can be done. I think it's, I think it's really, really exciting. We are literally on the, the beginning edge of what can happen and what comes next is going to be mind blowing. WWDC this year is going to be very exciting to see what, what comes through. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, looking forward to it. Hoping to attend again this year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm going to be interested to see, obviously, where, what they do in terms of artificial intelligence. And is it really interesting that in that MacBook Air press release this week, that they actually use those words? Oh, um, you know, they they called it a you know the perfect machine um for artificial intelligence really or something along those lines right i mean they, uh, but they use those words yeah. and they haven't used those words before no that it's always been machine learning for apple mm -hmm. so far so do you think those words maybe don't resonate as much because the first word is machine i think there's there's definitely an aspect of that and i think Maybe Apple are just realizing that even though they've been talking about it for years, people haven't realized that it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they were able to own spatial computing instantly and mm -hmm. people know what they mean. Whereas they've never used the words virtual reality or they've used augmented reality in the past when they've been talking about iPads, but never when they've talked about Vision Pro, I don't think. Not that I've seen. I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments how wrong I am. <laughs> you, you know, beyond all of the fantastical, mm. let's just talk about the kind of the, the human aspect that could come with Apple Vision Pro, right? Because, and I mentioned this to John, actually, um, when we met the first time. Um, really cool conversation. But I said to him, I think... And I'm surprised Apple haven't really demoed it in that way yet. And maybe it will do when, you know, the next versions come and people get a little bit more au fait with the platform. But at least in the UK, you have a defibrillator like everywhere and everyone knows in that local community where the defibrillator mm. is. Phone boxes, that kind of thing. Right. Um, I want to see Apple Vision Pro or something like that used in the same way, right? There is a big issue at the moment where if you see someone in need, especially in the States, you almost don't want to help because you could get into trouble if you do the wrong thing, mm. right? You, you put someone in the wrong way or, you know, you, ha you don't have the training. And so therefore people kind of stand back and aren't as eager. Mm. If you could put on the Apple Vision Pro, dial in to 911 services or 999. And they guide you. And they're able to see a live feed of what you're doing and guide you. Think of how many lives that could save, mm. right? Um, that's the kind of thing that I think we're going to end up seeing with Apple Vision Pro or at least, you know, Vision OS as a platform. Um, and then I think about that same kind of concept, but in a less dramatic way mm -hmm. in the sense of, I don't know how to change the oil in my car. Yeah. I haven't got a clue. Right. And suddenly I can just call into my local or, you know, whatever mum and pop garage there might be 
and they're able to generate revenue yeah. from their office or, you know, from their garage, right? Yeah. Which I think is going to be really, really important. So I'm sure that will get taken over by, you know, the big motor companies out there and, you know, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there for people that are struggling at the moment mm -hmm. and trying to find that next revenue stream. Um, and I think if anyone's going to offer that beyond virtual assets, mm. it's going to be Apple. I'm interested to see what becomes the first spatial social network. Mm. That will be interesting. Who is going to create the first platform for those spatial videos to live on? So that's already happened. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, it's exciting. You can have a look at it on the vision OS Reddit. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple of platforms where you can share your spatial videos nice. with people and there's a platform, I guess it's a bit like chat roulette. Um, is, is that dodgy? Is I don't know. Where, I've never used it. Is where you hang out? I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I know of it, right? Yeah. Where you can just kind of connect to random people right yeah but instead you're doing it with your personal with your personas okay right and therefore it's probably a little bit safer yeah, and probably. a little less risque you know yeah so there are things happening mm. in that space already um it's interesting and i think things are just going to continue to mature so yeah i would say as well um a video that i don't think has got enough love yet uh, Jacqueline, mm. who we mentioned earlier, uh, nothing but tech, who happens to actually be in the UK right now. She's at a, an event with Snapdragon, I think. Um, okay. She has put out a video. She has tried over the course of three or four weeks every native Vision OS app. So she's got a video where she she gives a, a very brief overview of every Vision OS app, six hundred cool. odd. Uh, I think it's a little more now, but uh, at the time, yeah. So do check that out if you're interested in Vision OS, <laughs> um, which I know you personally are. Um, but yeah, this has been a great chat. Um, Sigmund, where can people find you online? Unless you have something else pressing that you need to tell us about. One, one thing. Okay. One thing. Had I want to ask a question to the next guest. Okay. Obviously, I don't know who the next guest is. Mm. Right? Because... What have you of course, got? A, a lot of YouTubers um, become your guests. Mm. I think I'm the one that isn't a YouTuber so far that's uh, on the show. Yeah, let's. Yeah, right. I think that's. I think that's accurate. I guess the question is: Are you concerned that by being a slave to the algorithm to a degree, as we all are, right? It's not a, uh, necessarily a negative thing. Um, that that actually has a overall massive effect on how we enjoy technology and you know how kind of happy we are to use it and like i guess how pessimistic we've become um when it comes to technology we're always looking forward and not really appreciating what's in front of us absolutely yeah and i think we will we will continue this um is there anyone you think we should interview for the podcast. Ooh. Could be anyone. The person that I'd love to hear from. Um, and and actually, yeah, yeah. The person that I'd love for you to interview is Jason Snell. Okay. Six Colours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think that would be a really good interview cool. there. Um, he's a really, really interesting guy, obviously incredibly well respected. Mm. Um, and he's got a lot of thoughts and he, he will, uh, he will let it rip. I so. like, I like to have a back and forth mm. and I think, cause I know who I've got for the next episode. I think there is going to be a, a bit of back and forth on the next one. Sure. Which will be a lot of fun. But Sigmund, where can people find you on the internet? Tell us. Well, you can find me on Mastodon, um, on Twitter or X. Um, Nobody calls it that. And Threads. Uh, Threads? I, I'm, I'm there 
Sig Judge on basically most social media. Um, and of course, you can find my writing occasionally over at Max Stories, including uh, the TVOS 17 review that I did. It was like a nine page epic. Um, so, yeah, you wouldn't believe there was that much to write about, but there really is. There's a lot going on there mm. on TVOS. And of course, on the podcast, uh, myself and Devin Dundee, uh, we host a podcast specifically about apple tv and the world surrounding it uh, every week magic rays of light over on your podcast player of choice and of course at maxstories.net sigmund thank you so much for joining me it's an absolute pleasure as always um it was superb to meet you down at Battersea in real life irl away from keyboards and all that jazz uh thank you so much for being here Thank you, everyone, for listening and potentially even watching some of you. I, I know some of you will put up with our faces throughout this epic, and it is an epic length podcast. Thank you so much for being here, and we will see you on the next one. Final word? Go on, then. Get well soon, Ted. <laughs> He's good. He's good now. He shouted at the end of the last one. It was great. A complete revolution. We figured out a way. We machine all of the surfaces to create something that's that's genuinely new. You have to to start again. Unapologetically plastic. Aluminium.